This week on Q&A, our guest is Pulitzer Prize-winning author Tracy Kidder. His newest book is called Strength in What Remains, A Journey of Remembrance and Forgiveness. It's the story of a young man from Burundi, his escape to the United States with no money and few English skills, and his journey to become a medical doctor. Tracy Kidder, when did you know you had a book called Strength and What Remains? Well, I think actually when I went and heard the story from him for myself, um, the outlines of it, I, I, I had, had met him three years previously, in De Deo that is, and um, when he told me this, the story, the, the, the rough outlines of it, he, it was something, I mean, it seemed very dramatic and I was drawn to it, and, and I, but, but it was one small thing really that convinced me that I wanted to do it, which was that he told me that when he was homeless in New York City, having, having fled, you know, first civil war and then genocide in East Central Africa, and getting to New York City, coming without any English, hardly any money, no friends or relations. Anyway, he was living in Central Park, but he told me that he would, he would look both ways, all, all around him, to make sure that no one saw him entering the park at night. Because anyone who saw him entering the park at that hour would realize that he was homeless. And he found this humiliating. And I remember, when he t I remember him telling me this, and I remember thinking about my daughter, who I think she was about 10, went to New York City with my wife. And, at some point tried to cross the street against the light and my wife yelled at her and afterwards my daughter said, thanks a lot mom for ruining my reputation in New York City. And you know, somehow or other I knew that what I was hearing was, was, the, was the true thing and I, and I could imagine myself in that situation fearing the eyes of strangers, people whom I'd, you know, and, and the, the contempt or the pity of, of strangers, people I'd never see again and somehow it made me feel that I could find a way into this story. To understanding it, the country he came from was Burundi, correct? And I read that it's sixty percent Catholic. I think it's it, well, the last figure I saw was about seventy percent. And his name is Dale Gracias. Yes, it is. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Where did he get the name? His mom gave it to him. She uh, uh, this church Latin that she learned. It, uh, you know, she she uh, is a remarkable woman, but illiterate. Burundi, how big? What surrounds it? It's roughly the size of Belgium. It's a cruel and stupid colonial master. Stupid back then. Uh, it's about the same size as Rwanda, which uh, is the nation to the north and, of course, far better known. Uh, they are both agrarian nations, mountainous nations, very beautiful. To one side of, of Burundi is uh, Lake Tanganyika, or to the southern part of Burundi, and to the other is, um, uh, and the Congo is across th that way. The Democratic Republic of Congo, and the other way is Tanzania. So it's this little, little tiny countries. They're they're centuries old. They're ancient kingdoms. Uh, both countries, Rwanda and Burundi, and they're like fraternal twins, very alike, but very different in in consequential ways. There's no picture of Deo Gracias in this book. Deo, uh, no, and that's uh, deliberate. Uh, Deo is very publicity shy, and I think he feels. I mean, I didn't. I didn't try to talk him into letting me do this, but it took him a long time to decide that he wanted to. And I think that he, uh, you know, I think he always had strongly mixed feelings. He comes from a culture where silence is valued. Um, on the other hand, he did tell me at one point that he didn't want to be silenced. Um, and I, at his request, have just tried to keep him, you know, out of the limelight. But he's real. We know. He's where is he today? Uh, I'm not going to say. He's, he's back in medical school, but I'm not going to say where. Back in medical school in the United States? Uh, yeah, more or less. <laughs> oh, and, and, I'm sorry. Well, he, so he didn't get a medical degree. No, no. He, he dropped out of uh, medical school. He, was, he, he, he had completed one year of medical, tra medical training here, when, and he tried to do too much, I think. He, he was trying to do that while managing the, the construction of this clinic and, and health system public health system in back home in Burundi. A remarkable thing that he undertook to do. Here he is, an American citizen, and yet he decided that he must go back to Burundi uh, and build a, a clinic and public health system in a rural place just to try to contribute to uh, what he, one hopes is the rebuilding of, the, of that country. The country was plunged into civil war for 13 years. Um, terrible civil war. He, he fled the origins of it. but. I mean, this was an act of um, 
ideal, you know, an idealistic act, and he's and it's been very effective. But he, I think it, it just made it impossible for him to continue medical school. So he, in a sense, he deferred it. And he's, but the clinic is up and functioning. It's doing really well now. It has a tremendous amount of American support as well as Burundian support. It's called Village Health Works. Where is it located? It's located in a village called Kigutu in um, in Burundi. In Let's get a quick timeline. Uh, Deo, we'll just use the short yeah, formula. Yep. Deo was born what year? Uh, I should know. He, uh, eight, I vaguely remember 1970. Am I no, right? no, no. Uh, it would be 80... Uh, what am I... Why am I? Uh, yes, of course, 1970. I believe he's born in 70 or 68. I, I'm, I'm, I'm He'd sure. be roughly 39, 38, 39. Yeah, yeah, about 38, 39. Yeah. And he lived in Burundi for how long? Uh, until 1994. I never left. Well, he went once to Rwanda, but he never left it otherwise. Well, you know, we've re read a lot about Rwanda and the 800,000 to a million people who exactly. were slaughtered, the Tutsis and the Hutus. But there are Hutsi, the Tutsis and the Hutus are in Burundi. But yeah. you never hear about all that. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their lives there. Exactly. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why the one country got all that, uh, the catastrophe in one country got all that publicity and the catastrophe in the other didn't. Um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate in some ways because, you know, Rwanda does get considerably more international aid at this point. And Burundi needs it at least as much, probably quite a bit more. Um, this this ethnic uh, these ethnic wars. I mean, in, in in Rwanda, that was definite. That was a genocide planned by a faction in the government. In Burundi, it was really a civil war, an ethnic war. But these categories are really bizarre and and difficult to understand. The history of them is murky, They're, and and disputed. The actual ethnic compositions of both countries are also not precisely known and have been used for political purposes over the years. But, but I think it's fair to say that there are, that the big majority is Hutu and the big minority is Tutsi. Uh, uh, the two countries, uh, uh, what, what essentially happened was that in Burundi particularly, the, this difference pre-existed the arrival of the Europeans, first the Germans, then the Belgians. But uh, it wasn't the most significant, as I understand the history, the most significant uh, the social distinction, not by a long shot. And, uh, but the Belgians, as they did in Rwanda, uh, made it into something it had never been before, which was a, a racial difference, which is complete nonsense, of course. Um, these are people who had lived together for centuries. And there even, there even was some, the, the, the Burundian society was very complex and there was some permeability uh, more than perhaps in, in Rwanda. In any case, I, I mean, what, what happened was that you know, for the advantage of, of a few, and, and post, uh, I'm sorry, I'm being so incoherent, post-colonialism, uh, post um, of course, the uh, people trying to get power, um, some used, used these, this difference uh, as, a, as a way to, to gain power, and it, it had terrible consequences in both countries, of course. So in 1970, born, 1994, came to the United States. In 1994, what was he doing in Burundi? He was a young medical student. He third, he, I think he had just finished his third year. Um, he was working as sort of as a, um, it's, it was on the European system, so it's seven years of medical training, but he was in his, at the end of his third year, he was working as a sort of intern at a large rural hospital. And the uh, first elected president of Burundi uh, had been assassinated. And uh, all hell broke loose, quite literally, in uh, um, sort of, rebel militiamen um, came into the hospital and s just started killing people, um, presumably trying to kill Tootsies, but... And he, he was a Tootsie. Or he, he, is a, he is a Tootsie, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, those distinctions don't matter that much in Burundi anymore, as far as I know. I mean, except for the entrepreneurs of violence, um, because uh, Hutus are in power. It's the real issues in Burundi now are, are poverty. But in any case, just to finish that story, he, he left his door open. He ran back to his room, hid under his bed as others did, but left his door open. And for that reason, when the killers came to his doorway, they assumed he had left. He had fled already, so they didn't come in. So he lay there and listened and smelled the massacre. And then after they had gone and it grew dark, he escaped. And then for six months, he escaped on foot. 
first from Burundi to Rwanda, unfortunately, because you know, he thought he would be safe there. But six months later, the genocide began until he escaped back from Rwanda to the capital of Burundi. It's a long story. And then, almost by accident, ended up on an airplane going to New York City. From where? From Bujumbura, the capital of Burundi. Why by accident? Well, it wasn't completely by accident. He thought his whole family had been slaughtered. He had a f young, he had a friend, a medical school friend who was half European, and this friend helped him. Uh, his father got his father to get him tickets on Aeroflot, <laughs> um, and um, he helped. He showed him the ropes for getting a visa at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, it was a visa obtained under false pretenses. However, I mean that has all long since been ironed out, but. Um, and off he went to New York, not with no English, <laughs> 200 bucks that his friend had given him. Well, where did the 200 bucks come from? His friend gave him that. This, this young man who was half European, who had been his, a, medical stu a medical school classmate. So he arrives in the United States with $200 in his pocket and... No English. Knows nobody. Knows nobody. And doesn't speak English. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty tough. When and, did you first meet him? I met him in 2003. I had gone to visit Paul Farmer, one of my previous subjects or victims. <laughs> uh, uh, he had had an operation. My wife and I went to see him, and Dale was there in the apartment. And as it happened that day, I talked to Paul mostly, and my wife talked to Dale and heard a fragment of his story, which she then told to me in the car going back. And so it sat in my mind, the back of it. What year was this? Years. That was 2003, and then I went to see him again in 2006. It takes me a while sometimes to... <laughs> and then uh, how, how many places did you go with him to tell the story, and how many days did you spend with him, do you suspect? Well, I, um, <clears throat> I went to um, New York with him, and I spent a fair, I've spent a fair amount of time in New York with him. It, the time that I spent with him, you know, t time in these... I did not spend anywhere near as much time with him in any of these places as I have with some people in the past, but time is elastic in these situations. It was really intense. So we visited the sites of his former homelessness in New York, and we went up to Columbia University, of course, and w which was one of his, the places where he was saved, in a sense. Um, went to school there. He went to school there. I mean, two years after coming to New York and being homeless in New York, he was enrolled in Columbia University. And it was partly through the kindness of strange, strangers. Uh, first, an ex-contemplative nun whom he met while delivering groceries who decided to find him a family. And this childless couple, neither young nor rich, took him in. Something sort of extraordinary. And the next thing you knew, he, was, he went to ESL, like, took, took an ESL course at Columbia, and then uh, soon after that was enrolled as an undergraduate. When you started following him, did, were you absolutely sure you had a book? Never absolutely sure. Uh, it always feels, is it, or I'm not sure if it's George Orwell. Someone once said that writing a book was a, I think he said it was like a long illness, but he may also have said it was like jumping out a window and not knowing what story you're on. Anyway, it does feel that way. But I felt pretty strongly that I did. And when I went with him um, on a, a incredible, the, probably the most intense trip of, of my life um, with a subject even more intense than some of my trips with Paul Farmer, when I went back with him to Burundi and Rwanda, uh, I, w I knew I had a book, but I, I feared that I had done something uh, wrong here. I mean, and that it just was so hard on him. To, it was as though these memories of his, memories of horror, were still alive in the landscape like some bacilli that, you know, long-lived bacilli and waiting for him to return. And um, I think it was hard on him. I know it was hard on him. Did, and you, pay, I, did you pay him anything? No, I didn't pay him. No, I, the agreement was, I, you know, I, I can't do that out front, but if someone agrees not to, you know, it's, agrees to that, then I can do whatever I want. So, so I he, have contributed get, to his cause, yes. <clears throat> so you get, does he get any royalties off of this book? No. No, I, I, no, not by, well, it's tricky. I mean, that is, once, once, I can't, I don't want to do what's called checkbook journalism. On the other hand, once, it, once this is an act of free will, from the, the subject. Once the subject says, yes, I'll do this, and no, I understand I'm not going to be paid, um, then I feel I can do whatever I want. And um, I found myself so moved um, 
by the beginnings of this clinic that you know that I did contribute and I have continued to, and I and I feel uh, that it's very important to contribute to his medical education. Um, you know, How I, close I, I, is I, he to the degree? He got a, he's got about two and a half years left. He's he's back at it. He'll do fine. He'll he'll get there. Let's um, get some more guideposts here. Um, yeah, you're a New Yorker. Lived in Oyster Bay out in Long Island. I grew up there. Yeah. yeah. I was born in the city. But, you know, I'd never seen the hospital where I was born, St. Luke's, until Dale took me uptown there and showed it to me. <laughs> what year were you born? Uh, 1945. Father's a lawyer, mother's an English teacher. As a high school English teacher, yep. You say in one of your books she's famous local high school She was teacher. a famous local high school English teacher. I didn't know that when I was growing up. But uh, in years since then, I, I keep running to former students of hers. One of them. My favorite one was said to me, did you know your mother was the teacher who uh, girls would come to if they had gotten pregnant? And I was astonished because somewhere, I mean, this is, sounds preposterous, it is, but I thought, I wasn't even sure my mother knew what the word pregnant meant. <laughs> I mean, she was so proper. It was kind of nice. Yeah, she was, and she, she used to read to us when we were kids, my, me and my brothers. You went to Andover Phillips Academy. Yeah, and I was what, what's the impact of that place on you? Well, it's a uh, it's ambivalent. Uh, I, I mean, I feel ambivalent about it. It it, um, it was the most rigorous part of my education, without question, and it was a place where you know you had to you had to learn to write an English sentence and a paragraph and so on. On the other hand, it was a very cruel place. It was all boys then, um, and it seemed to me there was no meaningful adult supervision. And I, I remember we had to go to chapel every day. And I don't remember a single sermon on the cruelty that was just rampant in the student body. I was, um, I, I, don't, I don't look back on it, at all, on it all that fondly, but I, you know, I'm grateful for that kind of education. It was a, it was this kind of Jeffersonian academy. It wasn't one of the snootier prep schools. It, it you know, it sort of seemed to honor you know, it was a place where you could excel academically and certainly athletically and be praised, but it was very cruel to people who were neither. When did you use the first name John? <laughs> I tried to use it when I was there, but because I wanted to change my name. You know, I, I wanted to, you know, I don't know, just, do other people do this when they get to be teenagers? I wanted to be someone else, and, um, but I, and I think I tried to use it there, but when people called me John, I didn't know who they were talking to. <laughs> I said, oh, well. Heck with it, and if, I might have I might have done it if I'd known that Tracy was going to become such an androgynous name. My, it's my mother's maiden name, my middle name. What the heck? On to Harvard. On to Harvard. Study what? First, I studied uh, political science, which at Harvard is called government, which I've always thought was a statement of its intentions. And at that time, in '63, it really was practically the government d during JFK's, you know, first. Uh, uh, presidency dur during JFK's presidency, and I, um, but I got kind of bored with it, and I remember I quit. Um, and also by then I discovered writing. I discovered writing short stories in a creative writing class, and I was taking a course from the then not very famous Henry Kissinger uh, in something to do with World War One. And I, uh, I remember there was a debate. He decided to have a debate with his graduate students some of them about the Vietnam War. And I, I, I got up and left and uh, quit studying political science and went over to the English department office and signed up. I should have stayed around to listen to that debate, as, as I think I've written in my little memoir about Vietnam. What was his teaching uh, technique? Was it any good? I didn't think so, but I could hardly understand him. I just remember the line, France was a demoralized nation after World War I, which of course is true. but I. It's not wasn't entirely Mr. Kissinger's fault. I was, um, I had by, by this time decided I was going to be a writer. That I already was a writer. I was going to, um, and I didn't think writers should be interested in politics. I, I was callow, of course. I, it hadn't occurred to me then that writers ought to know about something so as to have something to write about. <laughs> I tried to. Uh, I, I count nine books. Um, let's see. There's. Um, um, <laughs> uh, and that's not counting Ivory Fields. <laughs> no, uh, that was this hard, dreadful novel I wrote after Vietnam about experiences I didn't have in Vietnam. I thought there were seven. Well, let oh, me. Oh, I, oh, oh, wait. No, okay. There's. 
Well, let me let me just tell you what I want to do, because I want to go through them very quickly and give sure. you a, a synopsis, a brief synopsis of the book. I went on Amazon and found each of the books and found the number of reviews. And mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the least reviewed book of yours. And it's one that you can buy, but you have to spend between $69 and $200 to get it. It's called The Road to Yuba City. Well, I, you know, that's a book that uh, that disappeared, I hoped, with, without a trace. And, and, and I, I ended up buying the rights to it back so that it couldn't be republished. And I've even told Google they can't publish it. But Amazon sells about, I think they have they about do. seven or eight copies of it, yeah. Oh. $69 is the least expensive of it. One review, what was it quickly in 1974? Uh, I don't know. I mean, what was the book? Oh, it was about a murder case, a terrible murder case in California where a bunch of rare, um, migrant work, uh, no, a bunch of uh, mostly uh, uh, not migrant workers so much. Uh, what, what used to be called hobos were, were slaughtered and um, buried in a, in a, in a uh, grove in, in the Sacramento Valley. Nonfiction? Yeah. And you really dislike it so much you don't want anybody to read yeah, it? Yeah, I think it was a naive book and it's not very... I, I just put, I don't want to read it either. <laughs> well, the second least reviewed book is Old Friends. I mean, these, these numbers don't mean anything. It's just a way yeah. to get you to talk about it. That was 1993, Old Friends, and it's actually uh, on the list of bestsellers, it's 241,000. <laughs> but it's not in print anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you can still buy it on Amazon. You know, there's not many books you can't buy there. But what, that's true. what's that story? And, that's about a couple of old, primarily about a couple of old men in a nursing home. In, uh, in nonfiction in Massachusetts, um, and, and uh, you know, I guess the short way to say it is they're doing something more interesting than playing bingo in their last days on Earth. Um, I still think it's a really good book. Where is it? Uh, it's n in no Northampton, Massachusetts. And Northampton is a, uh, a place that you wrote a book about. Yes, it is. Did you? Which did you discover first? Because uh, hometown, the book on Northampton came after that. So, did you discover the idea of doing the book when you were doing? I, I think Old actually uh, they they weren't exactly related. I had for quite some time uh, been writing about books, um, writing books uh, that were set very close to my home in New England. Um, and where in, was that? Massachusetts. Where did you live? A little town uh, just north of Northampton called Williamsburg. I still live there, and and I love it there. But I, I suddenly. I mean, they were getting closer and closer, the, the subjects. They were just down the street by the end. I started writing about Northampton for two reasons, I think. Uh, one was that I had um, been, in, been in Haiti and, and, uh, uh, in 94 when we sent all those troops there. Um, and I was struck by, you know, uh, you know, I'd come from a place where practically nothing worked. And it seemed to me that this town um, worked rather nicely, and I wondered why. I mean, it was a, that was a general thing. But the real reason I, I did it was almost, it's almost always been the case with me. I meet somebody. I mean, that's, the, for me, a character has primacy. I'm a storyteller, if, if, if I'm anything at all. Um, and, and story, and, and, you know, human characters, the end, catching that ca reflection of human character on the page is the, is the uh, sine qua non, it seems to me, of storytelling. I, I met this cop. He had, a, he had stopped me for speeding. And, and then I remembered, and he had stopped my wife for speeding the same day, hadn't given her a ticket. And it turned out that he didn't usually give women tickets because he didn't like to see women cry. And he, <laughs> although <coughs> he would give them tickets if they were already crying because he'd say, she's already upset, I might as well write her up. <laughs> anyway, this guy was very engaging, lovely, I, I think a wonderful young man, uh, he's not that young now, named Tom O'Connor. And he said to me, Come right around with me in my squad car. He was a sergeant then or something. I'll show you a, a town you never thought existed. I, I don't know if those were his exact words. But did you, did he know you were a writer? Yeah, he did. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and he did, and I got fascinated. I mean, this is such a peaceful-looking town, and, and it is a peaceful town. But it, like every place in America, it had an underbelly. And, of course, that was... I, it just seemed like a wonderful way to see a place through the eyes of a small-town cop. Uh, and and his own anyway, and his own stories in there mingled with some other stories of, of people in the town. Well, there's that wonderful statue in the middle, of the, uh, right there in the city hall area of of Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge, yeah. Well, although <laughs> it's not quite the right size, so it looks like he's a his head is about well, it's sort of peanut size. 
<laughs> well, it goes, but what I thought was interesting about it is it goes from when he was, you know, like on the town council all the way up to being yeah. president of the United States, and it lists every job he ever had, which <laughs> he had them all. Yep. Mayor, governor, lieutenant. Yeah, that's governor, right. Yeah, he, he did. And then it's got Smith College, so... Um, which is a wonderful institution. What was your take on the town? What else, what else did you write about after you decided to do this? I wrote about one of the, you know, this, this strange denizen of the town. A guy had been a real estate entrepreneur who was suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder, who was kind of this figure, you know, he couldn't touch things. And I wrote about uh, a student at Smith who had had a, who, Smith has this wonderful program called uh, the Ada Comstock Scholars. Uh, and, uh, and she had come back after, you know, a rough life. To, to school and, and as a grown, as an adult woman with a, with a son. And, um, she, her story was, to me, quite moving and wonderful. Who else did I write about in that? A uh, bit, bit about the mayor and about my favorite judge. Uh, and, but mostly the cop. Did it have any impact on the cop after you wrote it? Yeah, well, I don't know if the book did. He, I think his experiences, the ones that I recounted there, um, hit one of his best friends, and he felt confessing to him to a, an awful crime, um, you know, the, uh, sexual abuse of a girl, of his own daughter, um, and somehow something got spoiled for him in the town. And also, he and his wife were turned out unable to have children. He ended up applying for the FBI. He's a proud member of the FBI, as is his wife. Um, he doesn't live there anymore. He doesn't live there anymore. In his, I had a, uh, his father was just one of these wonderful Irish storytellers, and he's he's since passed away. But he used to come back constantly to see his dad. 1981, uh, reissued in 2000, the soul of a, of a new machine. Yeah, uh, that's the one you got the big award for. I got the Pulitzer for that, and what was, I guess. I think it was called the American Book Award, but the people at the National Book Foundation said, just say National Book Award, so I have. Yeah, it, it, did, um, it did win these prizes. It, that's the book that made it possible for me to write for a living. Um, what, what got people's attention? Well, it was, it, you know, there was no such thing as a personal computer then. There was, computers were still rather rare and, and rarefied devices, certainly to me. When my, my editor at the Atlantic Monthly uh, suggest, Dick Todd suggested that I look into computers. I laughed. I said, what about him? But he knew this guy. And I went to see him. Uh, and he was at a company called Data General, which doesn't exist anymore. It was called a, this was a mini computer company. And he, um, he told me some stories that sounded intriguing, although I was kind of baffled by them. And what I do remember, get, when I, when I remember being hooked on this story when I, he said, go talk to this guy in my team. It was a team of computer engineers who were essentially building a computer against their company's wishes. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a, that's a little oversimplified. But anyway, this guy took me off the, uh, a guy named Carl Alsing, wonderful guy. He was a software engineer, microcoder. And he took me to a corner of the cafeteria that was as far from the security cameras, I guess, as possible. And he started telling me all these stories. And they were full of this martial language. People who shot from the hip and there was blood on the floor. And as near as I could tell, at this stage, he was talking about the creation of these <laughs> immobile plastic boxes, and I thought this is pretty interesting. And you know, you, that you started your research in '78. Uh, yeah, yeah, was it, yeah, I think so. Right at the end of '78 or early '79. But at the time, uh, how big were computers? They, they well, they were now. They were by this time producing enormous amounts of wealth. The, these mini computer companies, which were uh, really in service of engineers, and someone had, were really booming. Uh, the other, the big one was digital equipment, um, which also doesn't exist anymore. Um, IBM was still ruling the roost with very, very large, so-called mainframe computers. But the, but the, um, the moon shot had changed, begun to change the landscape because of the develop, well, the, ch the development of the transistor, which had led to the development of the chip, the, um, you know. Uh, had, as uh, this is sort of vague in my memory now, had really boosted a, a kind of change that was coming and coming rapidly. But I do remember some very smart people telling me, even at this point, you know, late 70s, uh, that the personal, the idea of the personal computer, that was a canard, they said. But we, the it Pulitzer came your way for that book, and what impact did the Pulitzer have on your future? Uh, enormous. How? Impact. Explain that. Well, it just meant that, um, well, for one thing, 
I think it meant that I could write for a living. I think it, you know, it meant that um, if people, you know, that if I didn't make a gross mistake with the next book, that if I if I didn't choose if if it wasn't a complete flop commercially or critically, or um, uh, that 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 I could, you know, continue to write for a living because I don't know that the Pulitzer, the the book made a lot of money for the publisher. It made some for me too, and. Um, I think the I think the Pulitzer probably helped, but it it just it, it also changes your name, you know. If you get one of those prizes, uh, Russell Baker said something really interesting some years after that. I heard him say he talked about how you know he used to be so disdainful of the Pulitzer prizes. After all, Duke Ellington never got one when he was alive. I don't know how many decades it took for John McPhee, one of America's most elegant writers, to get one. But he said, you know, when you get one yourself, you start to think, oh, how perspicacious, you know, how smart these judges are. When I was a judge for the Pulitzers uh, one year, and I, I realized, you know, this is like all of these, all such things. Is, there's a lot of whimsy and cap cap capriciousness in this in the process. I'm not criticizing that prize over any other prize, but the, uh, you know, you, I was a little too young to receive something like that with equanimity at the time. How old were you? Oh. See, that was 81. I was 36, something like that. How often do you run into people that have read all your books and analyzed them all and become Tracy Kidder followers? Not very often. Do you know of any teacher that's using your books to teach writing? Um, to teach writing. Because um, I read a lot of reviews on Amazon where they were, they, they talks about one particular book of breaking it down and using it in a <laughs> writing class. Gosh, I'll have to make sure to avoid avoid that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just that I I try to av avoid reading about that sort of sort of thing. I mean, I want to go on to the next thing. I don't like to reread what I've written, at least after a little a, short, a decent interval part, because only two things can happen, and neither is good. Either I feel like um, I feel you know how could I possibly have let that sentence or that paragraph go to print. Or I think, did I used to write that well? <laughs> you know, it's not. Uh, the, the idea for me is just to is to get on to the next thing. I uh, I sometimes at bookstores, you know, when I'm signing books, someone will say, "I've read all your books," but uh, there's usually not time for me to have to ask what they think of him, and I'm not sure I want to know. I I've try I try not to read reviews. It's not that I don't believe in criticism. I think it's great, but I I find that unless unless someone you know one of my my, you know, some friend says you really should read this one. Um, I find they simply um, confuse me or you know preoccupy me in a way that I. Uh, and also, you know, it's funny. Once I've finished a book and it's gone to print, it doesn't feel like it really belongs to me anymore. I wouldn't want Amazon or Random House to take that too literally, but you know, um, but it doesn't. It's not something I can change, and uh, and I'd, I'd rather think about the next thing to. That I want to do. When did you meet your wife? Uh, in uh, 19, was it, was it 69 or 70? I was in Boston. I was um, sort of boarding at a place in the South End, uh, a place where I'd been helping the, uh, the owner fix up and in return for my uh, room. Um, I was a would be writer. I met her at a party. Um, I was quite taken with her right away. Does she have a profession? She's a painter. And her name is Frances Kidder. Yes, we have two. One is a, uh, uh, unfortunately, our, the, the one with, the, with my grandson lives in California, but he's, uh, he works for a small advertising uh, company in San Francisco, and he, he uh, uh, does a lot of video and graphic design. My daughter is in Boston. She's also married, but no kids, no grandchildren yet. Uh, and she's a doctor. She's a, a young doctor. She's really she's just a resident still. And you still live in uh, Western Massachusetts. Western Massachusetts. Uh, and how long have you lived there? Totally? Thirty. Um, 70, Thirty-three years. Thirty-three. Is that right? Yeah. Where do, you, where do you write? Well, I have a place also in Maine, and I've got a beautiful little cottage by a, by a little cove, and I. Um, what part of Maine? Uh, the the mid coast. It's it's on the Damariscotta River, and it's. Uh, that's a that's a wonderful place to write, but I really and I have a place at home. It's sort of in the basement of my house in in Massachusetts. 
I don't really care so much. I mean, the whole for me, the the real exercise is trying to become unselfconscious and almost unaware of my surroundings. Uh, what I do need is a door, and I have to be sure that there's not a place where someone could come and look in at me. <laughs> I don't know why. Perhaps because, you know, it's sort of like uh, surrendering, your, surrendering yourself to sleep. You don't want to, you, you, you could feel dangerous somehow. I think if, uh, if so, I, I just need, I need to be able to close the door and, and make sure no one can look at me so I can give myself over to something. What time of day do you write and how many days a week would you write? When I'm actually writing, I, I, I start really early. I try to start early, six, seven in the morning. It's just changed as I've gotten older. The last book, I, di I didn't do this. But um, usually that rough drafts are hard for me to write. And, they, and I have a hard time sitting with them for more than four hours at, somehow the most. But by the time, but I love to rewrite. And um, then I usually, uh, I can go for, you know, really long stretches, or I used to, sometimes 13 or 14 hours. <laughs> sometimes I'd get up really early in the morning only because I could, I'd wake up with this thing in my head, you know, at 3.30 in the morning. And rather than just lie there and vibrate and worry my wife, I'd get up and go to work. It's a sort of strange feeling to realize at noon that you've <laughs> put in a, a pretty long day. I I, I try to write. Um, I usually I usually but at a certain stage it's all I want to do. So I sometimes write all all seven days. This is private information. I have to say anything about it. But of all these books that you write, are you still getting residuals on all of them? And does that help you not have to worry about the next buck? Um, I still um, get some on the soul of a new machine, but not much on, on the others. Um, for some reason, the soul of a new machine was adopted by Harvard, by, by some class at Harvard Business School, and, I, and they're good enough to. And that was reissued in 2000? Yeah, but it, uh, the, the Modern Library picked it up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still in print with, um, with uh, Little Brown. After you did the soul of a new machine back in 81, the next one was House yes. in 85. And that's listed about 27,000 on the uh, Amazon list, which is hundreds of thousands of books. But um, there were 32 reviews, and um, that was Amherst. Where they, you, tell a story about the house. Yeah, I, I, had, uh, I had bought a house, you know, some years before that, and I got kind of intrigued in, in it, uh, about, about the whole business of house building. I, the house and, uh, and, and my hands still have some of the scars to prove my... I, 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 I did some of my own carpentry, sort of learning on the, on the go. And I got, I met these, this group of carpenters, and I got very interested in them, charming people, I thought. And uh, I wanted to follow them around in a building season, and suddenly a house came along, a, a brand new architect who's now very famous named William Ron. Uh, but this was his first solo design. I mean, he had worked on big projects before, but he, this was his own design and, uh, and a couple who were old friends of his who lived in South Amherst. And suddenly I had, what I've, I've said this before, but a menage a trois without sexual connotations. And um, there were some very interesting fights. I, and, you know, these were real craftsmen. These were Yankee craftsmen, although they were these carpenters. Was this a big house, by the way? Pretty big, yeah, about 3,000 square feet. Um, cost the enormous sum at the time of something like $150,000. And how long did you live with that process? Uh, I, I hung out with the carpenters and, you know, kept going among the various, to the various parties. Um, for the, I guess the whole thing took the better part of a year. Not, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe a little less than a year from, you know, the foundation to the f finishing touches. That was a, I still look on that book, back on that book pretty fondly. Though I haven't read it for a long time, I mean something fell in, in the place there that made a lot of sense to me. And I remember people. What I remember most fondly about it is friends or acquaintances asking me what I was working on and saying I was writing a book about the building of a house. I remember one person saying, "You mean a whole book about the building of a house?" But it turned out. I mean, it. You know, it's not really about the building of a house. It is, but it's but it's about something else as well. It's about social class. And, um, anyway, I found it. Um, I found the whole thing intriguing. I got fascinated with the anthropology, even the religion that's associated with building homes. And uh, I, I remember tracing the lumber 
the framing lumber all the way back to where it came from in the Maine woods. That was a lot of fun. I mean, it was at that, I was still quite young and I was thinking, you know, this is a wonderful job. I'm getting paid for satisfying my idle curiosity. You know those hieroglyphics that are stamped on framing lumber? And I thought, what do those mean? So I went all the way back. Did you change their lives in any way from that book? Uh, I don't think so. I think that I, I made a one mistake, which was that I made too much of a, I made it pretty clear where this house was, and I think it drove the homeowners <laughs> slightly crazy. People from time to time would just drive right up. Are they still there? Unfortunately, the man of the house died recently of cancer. It's terrible. Um, the carpenters split up after uh, a while after my book was done, the, 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 their team, uh, but I'm not sure that wouldn't have happened anyway. I mean, who knows? Uh, as for the architect, I don't know if it helped him or not. You'd have you'd have to ask him. I, he he was on his way. I think, pretty a very interesting guy. He has a, gosh, he's done, he did the um, the Azawa Hall, the concert hall at Tanglewood, and tons of other stuff. The four years later, you did Among ch School Children. Yeah. Um, that had a lot of reviews, 74 reviews, and they're still still uh, popular. 13,000 on the list. So oh, only, yeah. wow. wow. Uh, the Kelly School. Where was it? In, in a little uh, Massachusetts mill town called Holyoke. Um, and Holyoke had, was one of these planned industrial communities. Uh, Irish potato famine labor basically built the, the huge dam on the Connecticut River that powered these mills that made it a, for a time a very, one of the largest producers of paper in the, in the country um, and one of the largest polluters of the Connecticut River. Uh, it was a town that had you know, uh, that has had seen successive waves of immigrants, and the most recent wave was Pu Puerto Rican. What, by the time I went to the school, I, that, this is the one book where I actually went out looking for a per, uh, looking for a person, not finding a subject through a person. A um, teacher. I went looking for a school teacher. I, my editor's wife was an elementary school teacher, and she suggested this. So, I thought, well, I knew enough, I'd, I, or I read enough about. Uh, public education in America to know that elementary education was a burden that had been almost exclusively uh, carried by women. And I, I wanted to go to a, a school that wasn't, you know, in a fancy suburb, but th th this town seemed about the ideal size. I could wrap my mind around it. Um, Teacher's name? Uh, Christine Zajac. And uh, she was of the, of the town, and uh, she's quite a, quite a wonderful character. What, what impact did the book have on her? Well, uh, it could have had a much larger one, but she she's a sort of principled person. She she just she wanted to stay in the classroom, um, and then she when she finally sort of felt she couldn't do it anymore, she she told me she 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 went and became a, an assistant principal, and I think the school committee kept trying to make her take over one of the schools, but she had such a wonderful principal she was working for, she didn't want to do that. And when he retired. Reluctantly, I think she took it over. She's how, how did you do that one? Did you spend time? I, I, I spent, uh, there were 180 days by law that, that uh, the school has to be open, public school in Massachusetts. And I spent 178 days in the classroom. And I spent a lot of time with her outside of class. It was, a, it was a, an interesting experience. I, I, uh, it was, it's still quite vivid in my mind. I mean, she, she wasn't, a superstar teacher, I don't know, you know, uh, but she was a, she was just what these children needed. I mean, she said that to me once, said most, what they need most of all is a stable mother. That wasn't true of all the students in the class, but it was of many. And and she was very good at teaching some things. She, by her, she herself had acknowledged that she wasn't much good at teaching science. And in subsequent years, I think they tried to, you know, supplement. But but I mean, basically, she was conducting elementary school education uh, the way it had been conducted essentially for ever since we had it in this country. I mean, I, I think I wrote somewhere in that book that if, if a student could, from the 19th century, could have entered this classroom and not been terribly puzzled as to you know what was going on. I mean, ma many many things would have changed, but the the fundamentals of school, you know, you. Take a bunch of kids and you put them in a room, you close the door, and uh, particularly for little boys, you try to. You, you, it's, I also wrote that it was as if a committee, now lost to history, had, had sat down and tried to figure out what it is that the children are, are at least apt to do, and then <laughs> decide to make them do it, just to sit on their desks and, and so on. It was a 
there were parts about there were things about that uh, experience that were very discouraging. Of course, you know, just the unfairness of life. You know, it, I, as I think about this, um, I'm not I'm not uh, equipped. I think intellectually to discover great new truths, but I do think that you know narrative has a way of of of, of rediscovering those those things. I mean. For instance, in my current book, I talk about, I mean, that's a book that's about civil war and genocide, but we know those are deplorable. We know that uh, charity exists. We know that durability exists. And we also know that, the, that life isn't fair. But somehow or other, I think, you know, narrative can get you to places where the uh, academic approach can't get you. And, um, and to see it again in a vivid way, I mean, that was what a lot of that book was about. The, we Talked about old friends in ninety three, which was nineteen ninety three, and talked about hometown, which is about Northampton, Massachusetts, in ninety nine, and then comes along the book that's the most reviewed still to this day. Yeah, mountains, mountains beyond, beyond mountains, two hundred twenty four reviews on Amazon, which is huge. It's three hundred eighty nine on the bestseller list. Um, it's about a lot of things, including Dr. Paul Farmer and Brigham and Women's. But how did you get into that one? That was after you did Northampton. You're still up there in Massachusetts. You're in Boston now. How did you How did you find Dr. Paul Farmer? In 1994, I went to Haiti to write a story for the New Yorker magazine about uh, American soldiers in Haiti. Uh, we had sent, as you recall, something like 20,000 troops to restore the constitutionally elected government. And in the course of my time there with the Special Forces soldiers, I found myself out in the central plateau of Haiti in a kind of rundown market town called Mirbele. And one night, Paul Farmer arrived to to talk to the American commander it was a very day, interesting conversation they had. Um, I, then, quite by accident, uh, when I went home for Christmas, I left the soldiers and went home for Christmas to come back again. But I, I ran into him on the airplane, and I talked to him then. And um, How old was he then? He would have been, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm terrible about this. He would have been 30, late 30s, I think, or 94, my goodness, he's, he just turned 50, so, or he's just turning 50. So what? That <laughs> have been, have been about uh, almost 15 years ago. Yeah, so uh, 35. about 35 or so. And he was still, a, I think, a, an infectious disease fellow at the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Which is a part of the Harvard Medical System. Yes, yeah. Um, one of the great teaching hospitals in the world. Um, he had already founded this organization called Partners in Health along with a bunch of friends, and, um, such as Dr. Jim Young Kim, a well-known guy, and, and this Boston um, heavy construction guy named Tom White who put up most of the money in the early years. In any case, I, I got to know just enough of him, just enough, enough about Paul Farmer to know that he was almost certainly someone worth writing about, but I didn't pursue him for six years. And I went off and wrote my book about Northampton, which I'm, I'm not sorry I did, but it does strike me as odd that I would have waited that long for someone who was so clearly an interesting character, because I was quite aggressive back then. And I think the reason was Haiti. Haiti shocked me. Um, I'd been a soldier in Vietnam, although I hadn't seen combat. Um, but I'd never seen anything quite so distressing as Haiti. Um, you know, all that unnecessary sickness and death. And, um, and I think I, uh, when I got back from Haiti, I tried to reconcile the fact of Haiti with my own privileged American life and, you know, and, I, I, and I, I knew that if I started following this guy around, he would disturb me. He would, he would uh, ruffle my, my peace of mind. But uh, in uh, late 1999, I decided to get in touch with him. I started hearing more and more about him and, I'd, um, and he invited me to come and see him at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And How much time did you spend around him? Oh, uh, parts of, some of really intense parts of three years. The first trip I took him was about a month. We went, I went, I, I went with, I was in Haiti with him and then we went to South Carolina, then back to Haiti, then to Cuba, to Paris, to Moscow, back to Boston. That was what he called a light month for travel. What was your agreement with him about how close you could get to him and how much time you'd spend with him and all that? Well, it started with my doing a profile of him for the New Yorker. Um, but there was no there was no agreement about well, I don't think we ever had a sort of agreement he he's a sophisticated person to say the least and I think you know I I think he just he knew that I was going to write a profile of him I I think 
uh, he would have been much more comfortable with a book that wasn't as personal. But I, I thought I tried to make it clear that that was the kind of thing I was going to write. Um, after I'd published the profile, uh, I asked if he would give me access to write a book about him. And it took him a while. But he just said, finally said, yeah, all right. What's been the impact on him? I think it's been mixed. I mean, I think for him personally, uh, it's been in some ways really uncomfortable um, because, you know, he, he has said, quite, and I think this is quite true, that, that he's only part of a large organization and to single him out in this way is both inconvenient and unfair. And that's true, although I still wouldn't have done it any other way. Um, on, on the other hand, I think that for the organization, it's probably been a good thing. It, Look, I, you know, I didn't set out to do a good deed. I set out to, to write as good a story as I found an interesting story and I wanted to write it as well as I could. So I don't want to take a lot of credit for, for this, but it has helped Partners in Health quite a bit. I gather one of the major donors to the organization um, told me that he had done a sort of canvas of other major donors, and it seemed like a, a majority of them had come to it through my book. How many? Can you tell us how many copies? Been sold that book? I don't know exactly. It's something on the order of eight hundred thousand. Um, it's major money for Tracy Kenner. Well, yeah, but a lot of it. Uh, I, I I finally got some royalties the other day. I mean, I was well paid. For, I got a good advance. Uh, I shouldn't. I'm, I'm I'm certainly not complaining. But the the fact is that most of those sales, I'd say the majority of them, have gone to colleges for one reason or another. Um, a host of colleges, something on the order of one hundred and fifty, have. Um, chosen to inflict it on their incoming students. And uh, those are great, that's great business for a publisher because there are no returns and they get to ship all the books to one place and they get to pay me a quite a vastly reduced royalty. Is that right? Is yeah, that on these special sales, go? on these special sales. I, I, I perhaps just was careless looking at the contract, but I, look, I'm, I'm doing fine. I, I have no complaints. But if you move off of that 2000, Oh, wait, you, you went to 2005. We haven't talked about My Detachment, a memoir. Uh -huh. And we're <laughs> running out of time, as we always oh, I'm sorry. do. Yeah, I mean, that's a story about your Vietnam experience. But right. I, I, one question on that. Um, by the way, there's 25 reviews on Amazon, and it's 109,000 on the list, in case you wonder. <laughs> uh, look, the, the question I have on, on that book is, why did you wait for, what years were you in Vietnam? Uh, I was there from 68, June of 68 to June of 69. And so we go... 30 years later. Well, actually, I started writing that book back in 1985, and I put it aside because I was, it was, what I was writing was dishonest. It was weird. I was trying, I, I think, there, a lot of my time in Vietnam, memories of Vietnam embarrassed me. Uh, they weren't tragic, but they embarrassed me deeply. And um, I think I was trying, when I first took my, my first shot at writing that book, I, 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 I was trying to protect to make it seem as though this young lieutenant and I w were only distantly related, if we were related at all. It was, and it, somehow, when I finished um, Mountains Beyond Mountains, I, I was prepared to write much more honestly about myself, I guess. And I think, you know, for whatever, whatever else it is, it's a, a pretty honest document. And I, for some people, I, I think it's funny. Others have not liked it very much. Well, coming full circle back to uh, the Strength and What Remains, the book about Dale Gracias. Um, you said it in an early discussion that you met him in the, is it the apartment of Paul Farmer? Yeah, he was staying, well, he was living at Elliott House at Harvard at the time. Well, I mean, he had an apartment there. He was hardly living in any one place. But Paul had had this awful operation on his knee, and I went to visit him. Why do you call it an awful operation? Well, it was, a, uh, not awful, but he'd, he'd injured his knee years and years before, and he'd finally had to fix it, and I guess it was a it was major surgery. I remember he was he was really in bed. He couldn't get out of bed. How did those two get together? Ah, uh, well, Dale found his way to Paul Farmer. He he was um, he had come up to Harvard, the Harvard School of Public Health, took a summer course. Dale had, um, and he had in the meantime before that though, it, it, browsing the stacks of Baker Library at Columbia, he had found this book called Infections and Inequalities, one of Paul's uh, books, and he. Reading and he thought, this is about me, this is about my people, because Burundi is a, one of the poorest countries in the world, and Farmer is a poor people's doctor, um, and so his Partners in Health is that, uh, you know, uh, cubed. And Dale just hit, said, I got to meet this guy, and he 
he was up at the Harvard School of Public Health and he saw that Paul was giving a lecture. So he went to the lecture. And afterward, he, he, he's a very thrifty guy, Dale, but he had left his copy in New York of the book. So he went and bought another book, which is a great extravagance for him, so that he could get Farmer to sign it. And Paul signed it. And, you know, he, so there's this little rock star thing after his talks. And he, Dale waited his turn and then said, can I be in touch with you? And Paul gave him his email. Dale went over to the library, Lamont Library at Harvard and, and uh, emailed Paul and received an answer almost immediately saying, come on over and see me at Elliott House. And they spent the whole night talking while Paul was doing his email. And neither did, one sleeps very much, I have to say. How did Dale learn English? And how is his English? His English is great. His English is wonderful, but it's it, it's salted with, um, I, I dare say, you know, French and, and Karundi. He speaks French fluently, too. Um, so he has these wonderful expressions like instead of, you know, he'll, he'll say, I had to bite my heart or run like a thunderstorm. Um, his English is, is impeccable. It's just fine, uh, but, but colorful. And uh, he learned it, he learned it by uh, initially in bookstores with it, and, and, and reading dictionaries and in libraries. And uh, eventually he went to, uh, he took an ESL course, a very rigorous one that Columbia has. And I think that's where he got it. Although, you know, even so, when he started Columbia um, as a freshman all over again, you know, since starting college all over again, he, he, he I loved his story about reading Chaucer. And he saw the, he opened this, the, the reading and saw one that April when his shorter sutta and said, what is this, Chinese? You know, and he was, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are his degrees in now? Uh, he has... Uh, well, he hasn't finished his, he, he could very quickly get a, 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 a degree, a public health degree. I mean, a, a, yeah, school of public health. Yeah, he could get one of the a master's in that. He has his, he has his BA. Where? Where do you get him? Uh, Columbia, and, and he doesn't have the, the degree from Harvard, uh, although he might go and finish that. But right now he's getting his medical degree. So those are the degrees. Your next book. No, I wish I knew. You have no idea. I have no idea. I, I don't think... I think it'll be different from what I've, these last two. I mean, Paul Farmer's story and Deo's story are in some way connected. They're both people who are, you know, to, whose subject really is medicine and public health and, and, and poverty. How, we're out of time, but how, how would you say your writing has changed from the first to the last? I don't know. I hope it's gotten better, but I don't I mean, in know. your own mind, how do you, do you approach it any differently than you used to? I don't think so. Each book asks something different from, from me. And, and that's one of the great things about this job, so that I can change, I can change the subject without having to change professions. <laughs> Tracy Kidder, author of Strength and What Remains and eight other books, plus the one we didn't talk about, Ivory Fields, <laughs> that went to 33 publishers and none of them would buy it anyway. Thank, Thank you Thank God much. they didn't. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Brian. It's a pleasure. <laughs>